Did you know that you can invest in real estate without having to buy physical property? Real estate investment trusts are a non-well-known, they're a non-mainstream way to invest in property and we're going to be covering it today on the, this episode with the Young Money Hackers. I'm Charlie here with Handel Kim. Let's go deeper into real estate investment trusts. All right, so REITs, REITs, what an exciting topic indeed it is today. We initially titled our podcast actually, uh, Houses, uh, well, Physical versus REITs, right? Um, REITs do end up getting physical property as well, but obviously it's fractionalized. So that's obviously a, a benefit that a lot of people get to have, especially in a situation where you don't have the full funds or your finances in a private, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, let's actually dive down into what even is a REIT in the first place. So I've, got a, I've got a bit of a definition going on here at the moment. Um, so real estate investment trust allows individuals to invest in large-scale income-producing real estate. A REIT is a company that owns and typically operates income-producing real estate or related assets. These may include office buildings, shopping malls, apartments, hotels, resorts, self-storage facilities, warehouses, and mortgages or loans. Unlike other real estate companies, a REIT does not develop real estate properties to resell them. Instead, a REIT buys and develops properties primarily to operate them as part of its own investment portfolio. Charlie, what does this mean? This means we can get exposure to those assets, those underlying assets through access to buying them like a stock on your phone or your laptop, basically giving you exposure to all those property sectors, such as like the like what you've just mentioned. Exactly. And all the income that associated with it and the rents that are going to come from it as well. What I find also really interesting is that REITs are also regulated uh, within Australia so that these companies aren't just collecting your money and your investments and just putting it into nothing. They actually have to back it up with physical real estate projects uh, that are backed up on their, uh, their, I guess, disclosure statements and everything else and the likes, um, you know, on a regular basis, which I think is one of the best protections that we enjoy uh, living in this, uh, in this financial jurisdictions that we live in. Uh, and it is a very advanced one, of course. Um, we've had a recent uh, saga with uh, REITs. You might have heard of REITs recently because uh, BlackRock, which is an internationally uh, large fund for real estate, um, they've actually stopped on fund withdrawals. You can take money out of these funds, just like you would sell a stock and it happens instantly. But it's just a bit hard if you have, you know, 50% of your investors all walk out on you at the same time because, you know, you, you can't actually, you know, sell all the properties and, and liquidate your properties at a flick of a finger like that. So uh, I think they did stop the withdrawals for a bit, but they have reopened it as the industry stabilizes itself. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be looking at the top 10 Australian REITs on ASX and voila, here we are. These are the companies. Uh, and if you actually Google A REITs, which stands for Australian REITs, you're going to get a much more comprehensive list available from the ASX website uh, where we're going to be looking at different kind of REITs across different, I guess, industries within property as well. And I think it's really important to highlight that property isn't just houses. I mean, the amount of and the diverse range of properties that we have access to in Australia is yeah. unbelievable. That's right. There are so many options with REITs that we get exposure to so many different sectors that we wouldn't otherwise get exposure to when we think about investing in property. You know, a lot of us think about investing in property and the first thing that comes to mind is a house in suburbia, whereas you can actually get exposure to farmland, rural property, medical storage, warehousing, yeah, shopping centers and offices and all these other assets in property without having to actually buy it physically. And that can be really exciting because we get the benefits of the growth over turn as well as some superior rental yields. So if you understand how this model works, you have a much easier time selecting which REITs might suit you the best to give you those awesome results over time. Awesome. Fantastic. So we decided to go through some of these lists and decide to showcase to everyone listening in. Highly recommended if you're just listening to us on Spotify that you check us out on YouTube because some of the visual data that we're going to have available for you today is going to be off the charts. So let's have a look at the first one. We're looking at Charter Hole Long Whale REIT. Now, what does this mean? Like, I, if we read this, you should have an idea of like what this is investing into. Now, this was a really, really interesting read. That's why I brought this to our attention today. Um, and, and the key word here is, uh, well, Charter Hall, because that's the brand. You might have seen uh, Charter Hall, you know, 
hung up on signs all over Australia. Uh, that they are a very, very big company. And what does long whale REIT mean? So we had a brief uh, go over of this uh, beforehand. Yeah, it's a very complex topic, but you did a great job of explaining it. So take it away. So what whale stand for is is weighted average lease expiry. Weighted average lease expiry means and. Uh, Sorry, weighted average weighted average lease expiry has a significant impact on your property. So, commercial properties uh, is valued on the income that it can generate. Income. So, if your income is at fifty thousand dollars per year, at five percent yield rate, you're going to have a valuation at one million dollars a year. If that five percent yield is compressed to two and a half percent. The same income at $50,000 is going to be valuing your property at $2 million as $50,000 is 2.5% of $2 million. Now, what's going to cause this yield compression is one of two things. One could be that your tenant that is promising your income of $50,000 a year is more secure or they're securing and promising that cash flow for a longer period of time. So when Charter Hall advertises their REITs on a long whale, we're talking about tenants who are going to stick around for years. Usually commercial property, property leases, commercial leases are usually in the length of two years to about five years. Okay, they're, they're your run of the mill average Joe commercial tenants, but you tend to have government tenants, petrol stations, or, uh, or, or specific uh, purpose built like stadiums and things like that, those kind of commercial properties tend to sign a 20 year to 50 year leases. Actually 50 years is actually coming out. No, sorry, let me say that again. They tend to sign 10 to 30 year leases. I've seen Aldi's, right? Aldi's, which is a which is a famous chain. They sign ground leases up to thirty years, right? Which is very long leases. So imagine imagine a building, right, with multiple floors. At the top floor, you've got the you got the NSW government, right? You got Centrelink on the other floor, right? And then you got the uh, the um, Australian Army, got the AFP. So it's like this general, like this awesome government building. They're not going to sign two year, three year leases. They're going to be each in there for ever right so that's the thing about long whale um funds now if you want to buy a long whale property a it's bloody expensive right the going rate for you know going rate for commercial property in the market right now is sitting around about that five percent but you get anything long whale another another property that has long whales kfc's and mcdonald's they love to stick around for ages kfc's never leave literally they're one of the one of the biggest backbone of a property industry in australia but anyway with the shorter with, with, with those super secure leases that are super long, you're going to get them anywhere between 2 to 3%, which is quite crazy, which then will increase your capital um, by another twofold on the other end. So that's kind of the industry that Charter Hall Long Whale REIT is in. Now, that's really interesting because now we're looking at the data, right, on that company. We're looking at a $5.4 billion valuation. That's what the company is valued at. With all the assets and everything that it has, it's worth $5.4 billion of real estate. Um, I would suggest that this valuation is quite close to the valuation of the current properties that they have within their portfolio. And yet we look at their earnings on their annual earnings, right? Their net income is sitting at $911 million, about a $1 billion net income. I'm not looking at the revenue, but the net income. So $1 billion on $5 billion is almost a 20% return and is reflected on the price to earnings ratio at 6.59. What physical property can you invest in that's going to give you a 20% return on your investment? So they're doing something right. And what's really interesting is that the class of properties that they're producing or that they're keeping in their portfolio is actually valued a lot higher than this. So the income should actually put the valuation a lot higher. So when I look at this from a stock perspective, to me, it's a very undervalued asset. And HD, I'm noticing that the last five years, we've seen steady growth despite having a 65% revenue increase over the last 12 months. That is insane. Like that is really solid numbers for a real estate investment trust. And scrolling up to the top here, it also shows they're dishing out a 6.6% dividend included in that, which means that right now could be a fantastic entry point for something like this. Exactly, man. The thing is 6.65% dividend yield backed on an almost 20% net income is a very, very solid backbone to be on. Now, 
Guys, this is not financial advice, so make sure you do your own research and, and you know, all the decisions that you make is, is you know, catered to your own. If you need a financial advisor, go find one. This is just trying to show you the way and guide you along the process. Looking onto some of the other REITs, we're looking at Stockland Corporation Limited. Uh, their market cap is sitting at a $10 billion uh, valuation. Their dividend yield is still dishing out around that 6%. Uh, P ratio at 12.41%, meaning that they're, you know, they're profiting about, you know, uh, sorry, I should have said it again. Uh, looking into a, looking at another company right now, it's Stockland Corporations. Uh, they do a lot of different real estate projects as well as I know. PE ratio is sitting at twelve point four one percent, giving it a net income yield of around about that nine percent mark a year on year. But the dividend yield is at six percent. Um, so obviously they're reinvesting about three percent of that uh, income, net income back into the uh, asset as well, which is uh, w which is quite interesting as well. But their P ratio is a lot higher. It's almost double, which means that this is a slightly higher value um, uh, stock. And you probably want to go for a slightly undervalued stock as well. Looking at Mervac Group, which is another famous one. Uh, and looking at the graphs, all of these graphs are posing a very, very good opportunity for entry as well. P ratio sitting at 16%. Um, I have not seen an industry this, I guess, well established. And but at the HD. same time, with a... <clears throat> At HD, also highlight to people why PE ratio is such an important factor in this equation. This seems to be a really like a reoccurring comment that I'm, I'm hearing. So like PE ratio, let's hear more about that. That's a really important uh, num figure for people to know. Hold up, young money hackers. We've got some exciting news to share with you because it's all well and good to hear what's going on, but we'd hate to see our young money hackers only listen and take no action. So. We've been working on some game-changing tools that we wish we had before buying our first investment property. Exactly right, man. And it all starts with numbers. Property investing can feel like an extremely overwhelming process because it's the biggest financial decision that most people will ever make. So we have developed a property investing calculator that will make this whole process effortlessly. And seriously, man, I'm actually so blown away at how easy they are to use. All you need to do is put in your numbers and the info will tell you if that property is worth it or not. I'm actually so proud of them. Genuinely can't wait for our young lady hackers to get their hands on this experience. But that's not all that's new here. We also have a mentorship experience. And that's right, we wanna share with you all the juicy details to see you through to that end goal where you're profitable on your property investments. We also come across so many investment opportunities given the property space we play in. So it'd be rude not to share those with our young money hackers. So if you'd like to get your hands on some of the deals we are talking about on the podcast, we are offering acquisition services where we and our team will hunt down properties for you to push the button and get started to add to your property portfolio. And what a dream it is, Charlie. And there's more. We're gonna hook you up with top-notch property finance and insurance so we can all sleep at night. But HD, what if I don't have the money to invest in any of these services right away? Is there anything for free? Well, actually, we can help you with your finance and insurances for free. Plus, there are a ton of free resources we have for you, like some of the investment calculators, books, and tutorials available on our website. Well, you heard him, everyone. So head over to our website, youngmoneyhackers.com, or simply click the link in the description. Check out our investment calculators, learn more about our mentorship program, and explore our acquisition services. At the very least, don't miss out on the free resources we've put together to help you guys get started now back to the podcast exactly right okay so p ratio basically stands for price to earnings ratio so it is basically price of your asset over the earnings right so with price to earnings ratio we can easily think about that across two different companies so we are company a and company b company a and b are lemonade stands and i am the investor i invest both a hundred dollars into lemonade stand a and another hundred dollars into lemonade stand b now, how much money they earn is the following. Lemonade Stand A earned $20 and Lemonade Stand B earned $2 with the same amount of investment that I've given each of them. Uh, then the price to earnings ratio for Lemonade Stand A is 5 and the price to earnings ratio for Lemonade Stand B is 50, which means for me to get $100 back on my investment, I have to wait five years if that's how much money they made in the first year. And I'm going to need to wait 50 years for Lemonade Stand B. That's the thing about PE ratios. Now, if the fact that a price to earnings ratio, uh, if 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 lemonade stand A and lemonade stand B only sells lemonades and they are still in the same industry, it is a very surprising discovery to find that the price to earnings ratio is this different from each other. Now, I would personally like to invest in 
in lemonade stand A because the same amount of money will be invested in to actually make more money. There is a higher potential for dividend to come out of company A than there is for company B. Uh, and the thing is, the price itself actually could be reflecting um, it could be reflecting the earnings very soon so that the price to earnings ratio could actually match more of the industry standard, whether that be 50 or somewhere in between the 5 and the 50 as well. So that's why price to earnings ratio is very important because that is going to simply determine how much money you're going to be earning for every dollar that you invest in. And this is really interesting because commercial real estate across the board earns about the same amount of percentage. Commercial real estate, once you invest in it, you're going to earn anywhere between 5 6 or 7%, depending on if you do the developments yourself or not. But to see that the earnings ratio to the actual price of these companies, these REITs, come in at different levels is very interesting. And not only is it interesting, these are the opportunities that we can jump into. Exactly. And so, so, so to simplify this a little bit more, would you say that it's better to have a high PE ratio or a lower PE ratio? I would be more certain to, uh, so, so, going, so going back to the lemonade stand example, we're looking at lemonade stand A, which has five, lemonade stand B, which has 50. So obviously gone for the lower PE ratio has potential for the PE ratio to rise in the future by way of the stock price increasing itself or by enjoying the steadier dividend payouts that's going to come from it, which is really exciting. So that's the thing I was talking about as well. So price, so what the, the, if you think about the earnings, I guess, earnings rate uh, for, for Lemonade Stand A, it's about 20%. And earn, earnings for the Lemonade Stand B is about 2%. Okay. I forgot to draw another zero there. Okay. So 20%. So 20% is coming out of A, 2% is coming out of B, and yet they both pr promise a dividend yield of 6%. Okay. I'll be more inclined to do business with Lemonade Stand A because they actually have money that they can fork out of their earnings to pay me as dividends, whereas Lemonade Stand B is going to be struggling with that. So those are the metrics that we're looking at across the REITs stores to help us how to choose which REITs are better to invest in and not. So um, awesome. moving forward, we're looking... Yeah, that's right. And yeah. moving forward, we're looking at uh, Center Group. Uh, where their PE ratio is sitting at a whopping 46, which is quite which crazy is because very they're... High. Now, yeah which is extremely high. That means their net income is about 20% of their book value. So on a stock valuation point of view, it is still valued very, very high. You know, it is at this point that I'll probably look at uh, like another well-established industry. For example, your, your banking sector, right? Your finance sectors across Australia. We look at Westpac, PE ratio is at 11. We got Commonwealth Bank sitting at 16. We're looking at ANZ sitting at nine and NAB sitting at 11. So around about the low tens to the mid tens is about the right PE ratio that we'll be going for. And, you know, as an investor, you know, just from, if we were to just look at the PE multiples, you know, it would make sense to go for the lower PE multiples, like looking at, looking at for example, ANZ would be a better uh, valuation. It would be a better uh, sort of investment metric measure uh, for those of you who are looking at PE metrics. Now, that is not be all or end all. Now, but it is something that could be easily looked at because obviously with banking, you can have different strategies to get more loans, to make more money. But with real estate, the strategy is pretty much even across the board. You're buying something, you're buying land, you're developing it, you're generating income on it. And maybe, maybe that the charter hold long whale read is, is able to give out 20% uh, on their revenue and, and the net revenue is net income because they're doing something more crafty than others, but it is definitely beating the market and it is undervalued from a stock valuation point of view as well, which I think is quite interesting. I think that's interesting too. Uh, and I really, th I like how you made that comparison because all factors the same, a lower PE ratio might highlight the fact that they have more backbone to their dividend. It might give people, uh, you know, it, it prevents people from being trapped in with these high dividend numbers. Um, it really gives, you know, it'll show people that they're paying their dividend from a place of strength, not a place of, you know, marketing and trying to attract investors in to keep their company afloat. That's a, that's a fantastic point to make because if you look at Center Group, their earning is about 2% of their uh, their market cap, uh, but the dividend yield is uh, is 5%. So yeah. their dividend is more than what they're earning every year. Mm, I, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, whereas this one, uh, okay, we're looking at Merbeck Group, the dividend yield is sharp. It's very low actually. Uh, and it actually matches quite similarly to the PE ratio that's been represented at the moment as well. Um, whereas you've got uh, you've got companies like Stockland, you know their PE ratio is sitting nice and low. Their earning is sitting about nine percent dividend yield is at six. And back to the charter hall long rate, we're looking at oh, six PE ratio, almost 
you know, 15% um, yield uh, on, on, the, on revenue and net income. And yet the dividend yield is less than half of that. So you tell me which company has better backbone in paying out and dishing out their dividends every year to their investors, which is quite exciting. Yep. Um, looking at looking at companies like Lendlease Group, which is something that I'm sure a lot of our listeners would have already heard of. Uh, Lendlease is literally everywhere. They're, they're, it's a brand that's everywhere. Um, and they're, they're actually making a net loss every year. With that in mind, what does their dividend show? Yeah, their dividend shows a 2% uh, yield. That was uh, reported as per, as per last year. And their PE ratio is sitting at whopping 251. So we're looking at price to earning ratio anywhere between like six all the way to 200, which is which is quite ridiculous. It comes That's to show a, that there is some, yeah. That can be a red flag. That's a sign that this is potentially extremely overvalued. Exactly right. And that's something that we're just making an observation on. Of, of course, you can choose to, the, these companies can maintain their marketing and their ability to attract investors and they just they can just keep going. Um, and that may mean that you may enjoy capital gains along the way if you invest into these these REITs as well. Because you know, over the years, you know, it, it, just looking at these graph here alone, you know, it's not ju- they're not just going to crash to a happy medium PE ratio always. They're not always going to do that. I mean, we got c- one of the strongest companies in the world on on the not not on financials, but on the on the charts is Tesla, for example, which has absolutely no earnings whatsoever. But their PE ratio is infinity. Right, so because the the denominator is close to zero, so if we look at these charts, I mean, I mean, across all of these charts, we're looking at a very, very good points of entry with a risk reward ratio. Just from this, just from the charting perspective of these stocks, is looking pretty good to me, right? And and obviously with a long term in mind and with uh, and applying further sound investment strategies, there are opportunities and potential for you to make good profits as well. Um, so we're looking at different kind of projects here across different shopping centers and office towers. And look, all this information is available. This is Google Finance giving you visual data and representation on how you can run the math. This isn't particularly hard to do. Uh, and so, and we've actually had the pleasure to look through, for example, storage REITs, which you and I have looked at this graph and gone, wow, that is a pretty graph. Yeah, this like, looks um, this looks beautiful here. I really, I really love this. Like this is a really interesting topic, storage REITs. The idea of owning storage as it is to me is appealing. So to look at the REIT version, Let's go deeper into this. This looks good. Exactly. And looking at the P ratio sitting at 5.7%, which is better than the long whale REITs that we saw from uh, Charter Hall. Well. But the dividend yield is a little bit sharper as well. Unfortunately, there's no earnings data on this one. But on something like this, storage is going to become more and more prevalent as we see industries like e-commerce pop off because e-commerce is literally just people buying unnecessary crap. Where is it going? Our houses are getting smaller because people are subdividing, moving into apartments. So where are all the boys' toys going to be stored in? There's going to be there's both residential, uh, like as in like you know uh, your 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 common folk demand as well as corporate demand for uh, storage, and that's obviously been the case over the last almost ten years, which is very very encouraging to see. So you want something steady? These are the research that you should be doing. What about what about rural funds group? Okay, rural is all just like farmland and things like that. Wow, looking at that PE ratio and the dividend yield as well, how amazing is that? Yeah, so this looks really interesting, the Rural Funds Group. I mean, Rural is an interesting asset class because it's something that's really hard for us to get exposure to without doing something like this. And as we can see here, we've got a 6.5% dividend and the PE ratio is 3, which is really solid. That's a really attractive prospect in terms of an investment long term. Yeah, that's right. I mean, trying to buy uh, rural or farm land as an individual, as a young person, young money hacker listeners, of course, you're going to have trouble because... A, you don't you don't have much data, and with this kind of investment, you really need acres upon acres upon acres upon acres of farmland across multiple locations to actually have that diversified benefit of investing into rural property. Of course, there's rural property out there that could fall on its face, and you're going to struggle too. But with 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 sort of corporate level uh, macroeconomic scale investments like this, where they're renting out this land to I don't know all these corporate ASX listed companies, whether it's West Farmers or whatever. You're gonna get these uh, these rental yields coming from them as well, and the PE ratio is nice and low. So this one really excites me. And just from the charting perspective as well, we're at a dip uh, that is quite similar levels to pre-COVID as well. And what really excites me about um, about uh, rural and farmland investment is that uh, Bill Gates has actually been buying up farmland like crazy in the United States. Now, Bill Gates to me doesn't matter what you think about Bill Gates. You could think he's a selfish person, he's a smart person, whatever. I'll tell you what, he's good at making money, right? Because he's a rich bloke, okay? So 
as of the moment, he owns a ton of farmland in the United States, about 270,000 acres. This makes him the largest landowner in the United States. Now, he's buying all this farmland, not because he's stupid, but because he knows something. All right, the guy, you, you got to follow the smart money. So why is why is farmland a thing? Well, it's all to do with food shortages. It's all to do with something that's going to happen into the future. This guy knows how to look in the long term and is able to see into that future. That's what I think about him. Doesn't matter what you think about him, he knows how to make money. Exactly. So, we have I to think be objective thinkers here. We have to be objective and look at what the masters of the game really do. And if he's, exactly. if he's buying into this, there's a reason that this... Success leaves clues. Exactly right. So, uh, so th there are rural funds that we can jump into. What about the daily needs uh, uh, read? This is a this is a medical read actually, uh, and so this is a pretty new read because it started in uh, two thousand twenty one. We're looking at PE ratio of six point seven percent. They're dishing out six point five point nine percent yields as well. Looking further, healthcare wellness read. We're looking at a very low market cap. P ratio sitting at 11 at 5.77%. See, you guys can really shop around on your REITs. Yeah, so this is really cool because this really highlights that there's opportunities for people to get exposure to all these interesting property sectors such as rural, medical, you know, commercial, uh, without having to buy the physical thing. You know, like I made a phone call to the banks a couple of years back now and I was inquiring about finance to invest in REITs so seeing if I can use leverage to my uh, to my advantage here as well and the interesting comment they made was the answer is yes but we need to see $15,000 a year cash flow in for us to be able to give you the finance to do that and that's on a 5% yield that's $300,000 now to some people that's a lot of money it's doable for some it's not it's not for others but it's interesting to know that it's a it's an opportunity that is within reach for some people. So if you're interested to learn more about this, make sure you stay tuned for the Young Money Hackers podcast. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Contact me, myself, Charlie, or Handel if you've got any other questions. See you next time, guys. <laughs>